It would be worse than being born blind. And she thought about it for a moment, and then she responded, there is something worse. It would be worse to be born with sight, but no vision. Think about what she's saying. Some people are able to see, but they really can't see the big picture. So we have a vision that we unfurled and unrolled uh, all of last month, and then this series is about how to implement that vision. Uh, hats off to those of you that joined with us yesterday. We joined with a total of five churches from here in Buckeye, did a fantastic outreach at Buckeye Park, and there were well over 200 people in attendance, and when it came time for the altar call, 14 people raised their hand for the very first time to ask Jesus into their heart. Is that not amazing? Yeah. Thank you to all of the volunteers. And we had, um, I mean, we had people working with the kids' zone, doing things in games for kids, and we had people uh, cooking hot dogs and preparing food for people. Um, there were individuals that staffed the booths, and we had people singing, making music. Um, helping all over that, that whole park. And it was quite an amazing adventure. And it is part and parcel of our church vision statement uh, that we're continually reaching out. We say it this way, we find purpose in Christ and share. That is our vision statement. We find purpose in Christ and share. And this series of messages puts it in gear and this morning, we're going to talk about principles behind sharing our gifts. What are the principles behind sharing our gifts? We find purpose in Christ and share. Purpose is defined as the reason for which something exists. Or the reason for being. The reason that we exist as a church is to find our purpose, our meaning, our significance our identity in Christ. And once we find our purpose in Christ, then we share. The first week of this series was about sharing my faith. Last week was about sharing my resources. Today I want to talk to you about the topic. I want to talk along the topic of sharing my gifts. Next week there will be one last message in this series of messages called sharing my space. Doesn't that sound interesting? Sharing my space. But today, sharing my gifts. Now, we, we've been living in the book of Acts for this whole series. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, all about Stephen and the way that he shared his faith. What a wonderful example he was to you and me of how to share our faith with others around us. Even when they picked up rocks to throw them at Stephen, he still shared his faith. He was an amazing witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Acts chapter 5, of course, last week, Ananias and Sapphira, really a negative role model, a negative example of sharing our resources, how we should do it differently from them. This morning, I want you to look with me to Acts chapter 13. As we, we continue the study of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, the first three verses, and, and uh, follow along with me, it reads like this. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So, after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. There's a lot I like about the church at Antioch. Antioch is an amazing New Testament church, and I think they're a great example for us. You probably already know this. It was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. My goodness, Lelania and Johnny, am I blind? There you are. I'm talking about you like you're not even in the room. You're sitting right there. 
if you, we want to help you guys, so God's going to cause that to happen. I'm so glad to see you guys here today. Bless you. Forgive your pastor. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm not, sometimes I am not Captain Obvious. The, the church at Antioch, they were an amazing church. I one time preached a message about them called a fine-oiled machine. Because they really had it clicking on all eight cylinders. This church was quite amazing. They, it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians, like I said. And, and it was really, here's what was going on. They called them Christ ones. These people are so much like Jesus that they just called them Christ ones. Can you imagine? And the, I mean, that would be the actual best translation. And then over the years, then came this phrase, Christians from the people at Antioch. Antioch is a model to follow as we traffic through uncharted territory. And in fact, we can image this text with the traffic signal. And here's the first one, the first point. Red, stop the animosity dead in its tracks. Stop the animosity red if, uh, dead in its tracks. Red means stop. My family likes to remind me that when I come to stop signs, I do stop, but I'm not always as, I don't stop as quickly as I should, and I, sometimes I kind of bleed past the, you know, the white line, and uh, um, never do that with a teenager in the car, because everything that I told Nick about driving, now he's telling me about driving, and I'm, I'm learning again. But yeah, stop, it means, it means, stop it. You got that red light, stop. And I think there's a great example here in this scripture of stopping animosity. When we follow Christ, we are going to have differences of opinions with other brothers and sisters in, who follow Christ too, from time to time, that's going to happen. A mature believer will manage emotions, put aside anger, and find a way to stop the animosity. And I want to be just very transparent with you and tell you that we as a church family are practicing that at the highest levels. We not only preach that and teach that, but we practice that. I am so proud of the team that God has given me and the way that we are able, when we don't see things eye to eye, to just embrace and then uh, find a new normal and work through that and move on to a new higher territory than what we could have envisioned before. You might think, well, it must be great to be a pastor because you really have your act together and you know you pastors are like right up there next to God or something. I don't know what you think of a pastor. Maybe I'm building it up too much. Maybe you don't think that at all. But some people do put pastors up on a pedestal and I've just got to tell you, be careful how high you place people because you can put them up there so high that they won't be able to breathe in the thin air because they're just human. Pastors are human. Leaders are human. And so we, if we have animosity, then we stop it. And i got to tell you, there are no two Christians who could be any more polar opposites than Barnabas and Saul. There's nobody that you can imagine who would be more polar opposites than Barnabas and Saul. Now think for a, a moment about it. Uh, remember last week when we were talking about Ananias and Sapphira and I told you, you know, that they wanted to give this gift away and, and they had thought, well, you know, Ananias thought, I can give this impressive gift and everybody around them just be so impressed and he was actually stealing part of it, holding it back and he was taking credit for the whole thing. He didn't have to give anything, but, but he was lying to the Holy Spirit and to God and, and he actually dropped dead right there in church. Then his wife... Uh, who was in a conspiracy with him, she did the same thing. I told you the reason they had that idea in the first place was that somebody else had given a gift in Acts chapter 4 and that someone was Barnabas. 
Barnabas had given away land as a, a love gift to the kingdom of God. And, and you might have your vision a little bit tainted where you say, well, you know what? Um, Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't have the right heart. Maybe, maybe Barnabas didn't have the right heart. Well, I, I want to tell you, I think Barnabas is on the up and up. Uh, he did not drop dead. He gave the gift in a spirit of humility and God just blessed the church and it increased. And I think there is a gift called the gift of giving. It's one of the things that we talk about in our spiritual gifts analysis. And so Barnabas, he's that guy. He's a giver. He's supportive. But there's this other guy named Saul who later gets renamed Paul. And you remember the story. Saul was right there when they were persecuting Christians. When they were knocking on the door, pounding on it, saying, is there any believers in the house? And if there's any Christians in here, then they drug them out in the street and they beat them senseless. And they said, don't follow Jesus anymore. Paul was the ring leader for that. Paul had an amazing encounter with God in which he was struck down by a bright light and fell off of his horse and he's blinded and he says, uh, the, the voice says, Paul, stop fighting against me. You are kicking me against the goats. And Paul's like, yeah, just tell me who you are it, because I'll stop. Whoever, who are you? I am Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. And it changed his life from that point forward. But now think about this before that transformation. He had authorization and edict from the governor saying, I have the authority to come in and find every Christian and drag them out of their house and beat them. It's not a stretch to think that Barnabas knew some people who were beaten by Paul. And yet, here they are, brother and brother, arm in arm, serving in the church of Jesus Christ. And then there's, there's another amazing story. Manan was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. One, one version of Scripture says it that precise way. He was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. There, there's another version of Scripture that says he, he was the foster brother of of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, if you don't know Herod, this is not the Herod that um, that we read about who was on the throne at the at the time when Jesus comes on the scene. Now, I, I should say not the Herod who pronounced the edict that every child born under the age of two should be killed, but he's related to him. He is one of the Herodians and the Herod's family, man, I, you talk about a dysfunctional group. Well, they were a dysfunctional family. And uh, this Herod that we read about um, was, was seeing his, his brother's wife was pursuing a family member. And then they ended up getting together. I mean, it just really makes it, makes it awkward at family reunions, right? It's just, uh, hey, Herod, how you doing? It's just been a little strange, it's been a little weird. And then, and then the, remember the story that his wife's daughter, who is a teenager, dances for him, and he's pleased with her and, and just taken with her, probably drunk out of his mind, and makes a stupid vow and says, up to half the kingdom, it's yours. Whatever you want, just tell me. And, and she, just imagine a teenage girl saying this, here's what I want. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And it was carried out. That's how John the Baptist was executed. The Herodians, man, they were a very dysfunctional family. And, and Manan is a lifelong friend, a foster brother of Herod. He's in that crowd. And now he's part of the Antioch church. Isn't that amazing? The second 
point this morning is the yellow light. And yellow tells us use caution. Guard against racism. Use caution. And whenever you see a yellow light, it always means exercise caution. Uh, when you're driving, although I, I'm told that there was one time a pastor who preached a sermon series called Yellow Means Punch It. I don't have any idea who that guy was, I'm sure. No, yellow is caution. Caution against any prejudices. And prejudices can come in all shapes and sizes. And one of them is racism. And I think Acts chapter 13 gives us an amazing picture of what a church ought to be like. The kind of church that I'm praying we continue to be. I want you to just consider who's in the room. Five different individuals. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, and Saul. Barnabas is from Cyprus. He's a Hellenistic Jew. He's been Hellenized. He's, he's more Roman than Jewish. He's very cultural. He's, uh, he's into the arts and he's an educated person. Simeon, unknown origin, but he's Simeon from Niger. The word Niger in Latin means black. He was most definitely a black man. And then uh, Lucius is from Cyrene. He's African, that would be modern day uh, northern coast of Africa, Libya. And then Manan, boy, what an interesting guy. He's Palestinian, he's Palestinian Arab. He, he is a Greek Herodian. And then throw Saul in the mix, who changes his name to Paul. He's Hebraic Jew. Now he is a Jew, but he's not really the same kind of Jew culturally as Barnabas is because he's more tried, tested, and true and more orthodox, and he's, he's the mainline card-carrying Jew. And you've got this mixture of all five of these people in the church at Antioch, praying, seeking God, asking for God's favor, God's guidance, and God's direction. And then the third point this morning is the green light. Green means go, right? Um, I know you want to remind some of the people in our town that green means go sometimes. It turns green. <laughs> You know, you can go on green in Arizona. <laughs> this morning, think of it this way. Green means let go. Let go. Be willing and generous. Green means go. Let go. For you and me, it, it means we need to be willing to let go. We must release our gifts and release our abilities and re release our hopes and our dreams, release all of that to God. What if it's not about you and me? What if there's something bigger that God wants to do? What does it look like for a Christian to completely and totally let go but that's what they did in Antioch. Look at verse number 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. God asked the Antioch church to give away their very best. To give it away. Paul and Barnabas... Can you, can you imagine a church that has Paul and Barnabas in leadership? Two of the most amazing New Testament leaders that you've ever seen. And, and they have a prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit says, Paul and Barnabas, I want you over here. We didn't see that one coming, Lord. What, what do you have in mind? This is, that, that will never work. What, what are you thinking? Well, these are two of our best. But Ad, God asked them to give away their very best. 
God is asking us to release to Him our very best as individuals, as, as a church family. See, the most important part and point of the gifts that God gives us to be used in the kingdom is to let go of them so that they are His to be used. I like to ask myself a question when I'm preparing a message. What's the big idea? What is the big idea? And this is it. The big idea is God's will is critical in gifts distribution. God's will. I don't always understand God's will. Just when I think I've got Him figured out, He throws me a curveball. Sometimes I think, well, I kind of see how it's going and I, how it's all coming together and what the plan is and then just whammy. Wow, where'd that come from? But there is an overarching will of God for us as a church family, for us as individuals, and God's will is critical in gifts distribution. I heard one pastor say one time, and it has stuck with me uh, all of my life, God's will. Nothing else. Nothing more. God's will. Try to imagine what it must have been like for the church at Antioch. Man, we just got everybody all on the same page and we're, we're just starting to really function. We've got all of our ministries in place. And then God's will. Paul and Barnabas. So as we head into uncharted territory as a church family, and as we put flesh on this vision, put meat on the bones, I'm challenging you here at the beginning of this whole new era, I want to challenge you with this thought to totally give yourself to God's will. What is God's will for you for your church? What is God's will for you as an individual? And if you are willing and able to surrender, then that's when the miracles of God begin to take place. This morning as we close, I want to just say these words. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should know Him before you leave this place today. You should. It is just as normal and natural as it can be. Do you know, almost every week we have someone who finds faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes when we, um, when we get to this part of the service, Sometimes I'll, I will give an altar call and just ask, does anyone want to respond and come to the front? Sometimes I don't feel led to do that. And this is one of those mornings. I want you to know that um, checking the box on the card, that's not like a, that's not a get out of jail free card. That's not a magic thing. I, I checked that little box on the connect card. I accepted Christ as my savior. And I know that you know that. I want you to hear me on this. If, if you want faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I am so proud to say that almost every week somebody checks that box and says, you know, pray for me because I'm beginning a new walk and, and I want more information. And, and part of the follow-up is we want to take those individuals once they accept Christ, then we want to funnel them into the uh, teaching ministries that we offer that give individuals a chance to stand strong on their own two feet. And I feel like there's some of you here this morning that you're going to get saved. You're going to start a brand new walk. And so here's what you can expect. that I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer. And I'm going to ask you to, to yes, check that box on that card and, and leave it out at the uh, out at the hub, that little black desk in the lobby. 
Just leave it there. Leave it up on top of it. We'll gather them together and we'll make sure they all get in the right place. Please give us contact information so that we can, you know, an, an email or something so that we can start that relationship. And then when the classes roll around, I'm going to be able to say, here's the one you should go to. This one is designed just for you and it's going to help you so much. Father, I just pray right now that uh, individuals would feel the presence of you, your spirit, holy God, just in this moment, let them know that there's something really genuine and something substantive taking place this morning. Perhaps it's emotional or maybe it's not, but this is not on the level of the emotions. This is deep inside of the heart. You are doing your work in lives today. And I just pray that individuals, I, I just know that several individuals are going to be saved today. They're going to acknowledge faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here considering giving your life to Jesus this morning, here's what you need to know. You forsake everything for the sake of the Lord Jesus. You abandon everything and you follow Him. It's absolutely free, only it costs you everything. You give Him your life. In exchange, He gives you your life, your true life back. And you get to experience true living. And so Jesus is not something that you just add on top of a bunch of other things. You don't just say, give me three pounds of God, please, and I'll add that on top of whatever I've got. No, Jesus is, is number one. He is the most important person of our lives. And so when we embrace faith in Jesus Christ, it means we forsake everything else and we follow Him. For the ones who want to be saved right now, pray this prayer with me silently in your heart. Truly mean this in your heart and God will save you. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son. I ask you to forgive my sin. Wash it away. Your holy word says that we need to be born again because if, if we can't be born again, then we cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And you are speaking not of a natural type of birth, but a spiritual birth in, whereby we are born to a whole new way of living. Now, I just pray, oh God, that right now in this place, in this room, that you will do deep spiritual work. The ones that need to be saved, Holy Spirit, just go row by row, seat by seat, and just touch each heart, drawing them, pulling them to yourself. So, Father, forgive my sins. Wash me and make me new. Take away all of my failures. I just lay them before you. I embrace faith in you, Lord Jesus. I embrace a very serious faith in you. I plan to follow you all of my life. God, with your help, I can do it. Be my Savior. Be my Master. Be my Lord. Because I want heaven to be my home. I want to be with you forever. And I believe that in this moment, because I acknowledge my sin and I come to you believing that you save me. And from this moment forward, I am saved because I accept you, Lord Jesus. I accept your love. I accept what you did for me on the cross. And I give you thanks. Help me to be successful in my walk with you and make every day matter. From this moment forward, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want the team to come on back up here. And if you did just pray that prayer, I, I would ask you to please, um, please do leave that information. You know, if, if you're here just as a guest, if you're here for the first time as a guest, we would love to get better acquainted with you. And, uh, and I'm not saying that, that you're going to check off that box necessarily that you accepted Christ. You may want to do that, and that's fine. But if you would, please let us know your name and, and give us some information so we can get in touch with you. And we are here to serve you. That's why we're here. We, we love God and we love you and we're so glad you're here. Now just uh, thank you for being here today. So if you're a guest, also, if you would just leave that card out front, we would appreciate that so very much. Let's all stand together and we're going to sing the song.